And we're back at it again, looking back at some of the best games that have released over the past few years. Today in GameRanks, we're here to talk about the best games of 2004. Starting off at number 10, we have Spider-Man 2, the game based off of the second Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. This was a big jump from the first movie tie-in game. They drastically changed how the web swinging worked. In the first game, your webs attached to some magical structure in the sky that you couldn't see, and you couldn't go from street level to like the top of a building. But in Spider-Man 2, all that changed. Your webs actually attached to stuff, and you could like see it happen, and it felt great too, dude. Like to the point where Spider-Man games that have come after don't have web swinging that's as good. Some people would argue that it's actually better than the web swinging in Spider-Man PS4. Treyarch did an amazing job with Manhattan as well, making it look just like New York. That mixed with the awesome web swinging, it was the closest thing you'd get to being Spider-Man. The game trailed away from the plot of the movies too and went full on comic booky. For example, Mysterio makes an appearance and you have to like go through a whole fight with him made up of illusions and it felt straight out of the panels of a comic book. This is a Spider-Man game that is definitely gonna go down in history. I don't think we're ever gonna forget it. Moving on to number 9, we have Burnout 3 Takedown. This is the entry into the series where it really fell into its groove and it knew what kind of game that it wanted to be. It was a bit more aggressive than the last two, while still being very arcadey. Criterion also worked in a new mechanic called the Takedowns. In Burnout, you kind of rely on speed boost to win, which you can earn by driving dangerously and pulling off some risky maneuvers, and Takedowns expand on that a bit, giving you the ability to slam into opposing cars until you send them flying off the road and cause them to crash, and doing so would give you a speed boost. And ramming another car off the road also looked really cool. This is right up there with Burnout Paradise as some of the best racing games ever made. At number 8, man, th this is a big one. Star Wars Battlefront, the first one, the OG one. This game was unreal at the time. I mean, it was a shooter with classes that took place on big battlefields, all on different planets from the movies. You could play as one of four factions, the Trade Federation, the Rebel Alliance, Galactic Republic, or Galactic Empire. Then there were hero characters that would pop up for a minute. So you could fight next to Darth Vader and Mace Windu, Luke Skywalker, and at the time it was like, Whoa, I could barely handle it. It was essentially the video game equivalent of being a little kid sitting on your bedroom floor with all of your Star Wars toys and just bashing them together. It reviewed pretty well too. Everyone mostly liked it except for the game's dumb AI, which was like super dumb. If there wasn't something close enough to the AI soldiers to interact with, they would just kind of stand there and wait, it seemed like. Other than that though, it was one of the coolest Star Wars games of its time, and it did something that I really appreciate in any Star Wars thing, which is focusing on something other than just Jedi. Don't get me wrong. Jedi are dope, lightsabers are dope, but there's more to Star Wars than that, and I love, you know, getting to see some of their other stuff. I don't want to just see these Jedi Knights running around with their laser swords and wearing pajamas. Moving on to number 7, we have Fable, an RPG from Lionhead Studios. Taking place in the fictional world of Albion, you play as an orphan whose family was murdered during a bandit raid, and your sister was also kidnapped. And as the game goes on, you grow up and you see your character age and be affected physically by the choices that you make. That was a big aspect of Fable, choices. You were put in certain situations with obvious good or bad choices, and depending on what you picked, it would affect your hero and their story. If you were overall bad, you would lose your hair and your skin would become pale and you would literally grow horns. But if you were good, you would age normally, eventually having your hair turn white with age. And if you were a mage, your skin would start to glow with magic. It was all really cool. And it was a weird game because it obviously drew inspiration from other RPGs, but it wasn't as big in scale. It was very small when you really like take a second to think about it, but that didn't take away from how enjoyable it was and how much of a unique experience it was. I don't think there's anything else like it. The look, the charm, the combat, the choices you would make, all these things come together to create this perfect package. We did get two more entries in the series before Lionhead Studios was shut down, but there are rumors of a new one in development by a different team, and I'm super curious to see how it comes out. I don't know if another dev team can really nail down the charm of the OG one. I don't know if it's possible without Lionhead Studios, but I'm here for it.
At number six, the jump from The Sims to The Sims 2 was pretty drastic. Those four years in between the games like really made a difference. First, you got a fully 3D art style and your Sims looked way better and way less blocky. They also made a lot of changes to the core gameplay as well to better simulate life. First off, they added new life stages. The OG Sims only had baby, child, and adult, while The Sims 2 had baby, toddler, child, teen, adult, elder, and young adult if your Sim goes to college. That was the big focus here, adding more things to make it more of an actual life simulator. You don't realize how much a seven day week actually works to make The Sims feel a bit more real until you actually got it in The Sims 2. This was also a huge step ahead for the series. It was way less restrictive and you could do a bit more and really do what you wanted. Like The Sims hype never really died down from the first game either. The Sims 2 may have actually been bigger than the first one and it was definitely better. I mean, it was an instant success selling 1 million copies in the first 10 days and 4.5 copies over the first year and it also went on to get eight expansions over the course of four years and people kept on playing them at number five we have world of warcraft yeah this one is a juggernaut it's hard to believe that this has been around since 2004 it still feels somewhat new seeing that it's still one of the best mmos around and has a huge player base and they're still releasing expansions for it too blizzard took the MMORPG genre, one that was kind of hard to get into. It was hard for a more casual player to jump in and start playing, and they made it easy. Then there's a social aspect of it too. There are so many people that play that there was a real sense of community, and there are a ton of friends to be made. I've heard of people building full-on relationships through WoW, which is, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. The world too was always growing and changing with each new expansion, new quests, new characters, new areas, weapons, armor, you name it, it's got it. They even added Kung Fu Pandas. <laughs> Like, come on. Blizzard really nailed down how to keep this game fresh after 16 years, which is, you know, crazy when you really think about it. And I get it. I see the appeal. A constantly changing world where you can hang out with your friends and, you know, make new ones. And there's so much to do that you always have something to tackle. I don't know. Wow, it's crazy. Every aspect about it. It's just, it's so cool. Coming in at number four, we have Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. This was another big shakeup for the Metal Gear series, which is crazy seeing that Metal Gear Solid 2 was a pretty big shakeup as well with Raiden and the story being batshit insane and all that. But yeah, two of the biggest noticeable changes made this time around are the setting and the playable character. First off, the last two games were set in more urban environments with Snake Eater taking place in a Soviet jungle, which was really weird at first, but then became awesome. They added a camo system that you actually had to pay attention to if you want to you know, successfully sneak past guards and whatnot. You were also back playing as Snake, kind of yeah you look like snake you were called snake david hater was doing the voice of snake but you were actually playing as big boss yep this is this is a prequel that's uh set in 1964 before solid snake was even born and big boss wasn't big boss yet this is a game that you see a lot on like best of lists and for good reason it was one of the better and easiest to follow metal gear stories the setting is so wildly different than the last two games there are some great memorable characters and it's kojima is all hell there are a bunch of direct sequels to this game also portable ops peace walker ground zeroes phantom pain which is kind of weird that you play as big boss more than you do solid snake i don't know i've always found that kind of amusing uh, anyway, there's too much cool stuff about Sneak Eater to fit in a single point, so instead, I'll leave you with this. The latter scene, the Snake Eater song, it's all you gotta know. At number three, we have to talk about Halo 2. Yeah, this is a big one for a lot of people, and, and for good reason. There was a pretty decent glow up in graphics, yeah, it still looked like an Xbox game, but a nice Xbox game. They added some cool stuff as well, I mean, dual wielding SMGs, come on. Playing as an Arbiter, so cool. Also, the addition of the Battle Rifle, love that weapon. Yeah, a lot of people would argue that Combat Evolved has the better campaign, but one thing Halo 2 definitely does better is the multiplayer. Combat Evolved multiplayer was fun, sure, but Halo 2 had real online multiplayer. You might even go as far to say that Halo 2 is what kind of made Xbox Live, like, matter. I know that my earliest multiplayer memories come from Halo 2, and at the time it was so cool and huge that I was able to play online with my friends. Halo 2 changed the game for online multiplayer shooters on console. Weapons felt great, they were very well balanced, there were some awesome maps like Zanzibar and Ivory Tower. Man, I have nothing but good memories when it comes to Halo 2. Coming down to number 2, we have Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, my personal favorite GTA title. This is the one that really set up GTA 5, which seems like the next logical step coming from San Andreas. GTA 4 seems more like a direct sequel to uh, GTA 3, not 
San Andreas. The biggest change in, in, in this game was the location. It's not like 3 or Vice City where you're running around one ci city. This one gave you access to the entire state of San Andreas, which is made up of Los Santos, San Fiaro, Los Venturas, with a big stretch of wilderness separating the cities. This is also the entry into the series that really introduced like real customization options. Yeah, in Vice City you could change outfits and you could also, you know, take your car to a pay and spray and change the color, but this one is where you could really customize stuff to your liking. You could mix and match different articles of clothing for CJ, you could pick out different custom parts for cars and bikes, and the game even introduced RPG mechanics. While GTA 3 and Vice City made their cities feel living and real, San Andreas is where Rockstar filled that world with stuff to do besides collectibles and quests. There was a big selection of mini games, you could also dump time into CJ, making him work out and such to get him ripped and in shape, or the opposite if you wanted to you could eat a ton of food and give him a little pouch to store his extra cookies then there's the best part of the game the soundtrack the game featured 11 radio stations but if you weren't listening to radio los santos or playback fm i don't really know what you were doing if tony hawk's pro skater is the game that introduced uh, me and a lot of other people to punk san andreas is the game that really got me and other people into hip-hop i don't know man just that san andreas is the perfect gta game that's really all i have to say Finally, at number one, we have Half-Life 2. This is the big one, the highly anticipated sequel to Valve's 1998 Half-Life. Half-Life changed the game, it delivered. It was a legitimately great shooter with a really good story, great level design and puzzles, and its sequel was no different. Taking place a few years after the events of Black Mesa, Gordon Freeman is awoken by G-Man and finds himself on an Earth that's controlled by the Combine, a multi-dimensional alien empire that conquered Earth in just seven hours. Gordon wakes up on a train arriving in City 17. As you walk the streets, you can't help but get an eerie 1984 vibe, and one of the big, shiny features of Half-Life 2 was its physics system. Eventually, you would acquire the gravity gun, a weapon that allows Gordon to pick up almost any object out in the world and then can be fired or moved around. You could use a gravity gun to solve puzzles by stacking boxes or other random objects out in the world, or you could use it as a weapon. Remember the Raven Home bit where there were a ton of, you know, circular saw blades lying around that you could pick up and launch at headcrab zombies? It was a lot of fun. The game ran on Valve's new at the time source engine, and there was a big difference in graphics coming from the first Half-Life. Enemy AI showed improvement as well. It isn't an easy game at all, and enemies will kind of think about how they approach you. Uh, I just recently replayed this one in preparation for Half-Life Alex, and I gotta say that Half-Life 2 really holds up still. And even now in 2020, there really isn't anything like it. Now that Valve put out a new Half-Life game this year, maybe there's a possibility for Half-Life 3? Who knows, let's just keep on beating that dead horse. Finally, before we go, we have some bonuses for you. First up, we have Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. This game takes two great things and mashes them together, RPGs and vampires. Getting to play around in the dark and gritty modern day LA as a vampire is an experience that a lot of people will never forget. Then we have Need for Speed Underground 2, the sequel to the awesome Need for Speed Underground. You got more cars, more customization options, and new and bigger areas to race in. And you even got a new explore mode that let you drive around in the game's made up city of Bayview. Finally, we have Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, based off of the Vin Diesel movie of the same name. This game honestly had no right being as good as it was. It's an awesome stealth game with some great lighting, and Butcher Bay serves as a great setting, especially if you love dark, gritty, bleak sci-fi. And those are some of the best games from 2004, but we want to hear from you. Meet us down in the comments and let us know what you think. I'm sure we missed something and we want to hear from you guys. As I'm sure you already know, hitting the like button really helps us out. And if you're new here, subscribing is a good idea because we put out videos like this every single day. As always, thank you for stopping by, taking the time to hang out with us. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.